What's going on, y'all? Uh, here we go. We back <laughs> for another show. Before we even get this thing kicked off, y'all already know. Um, I'm going to start it off with a moment of silence for our brother Cam. All right, so let's just go ahead and, 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 and attack that situation first. Um, me personally, I took, I, I took, I took it, I took it kind of hard. I'm not even gonna lie to y'all. And it's not because, simply because of, you know, Cam, because me and Cam didn't have like no strong relationship. We just knew each other. But from how it happened, you know, from what I was told, what happened, that really um, struck a nerve with me because I'm going to go ahead, before I even get into the rest of the talks and discussions that I've been having with people, I'm going to go ahead and give y'all a little backdrop about me. Um, in 2013, I wrote a suicide letter. I'm being 100% honest. And if if you, um, a few, only a few people know that story, but in 2013, I wrote a suicide letter. And when I when I wrote it, I sent it to at that point in time who was um my best friend. And I was like, I, I literally talked like, hey man, if anything happens to me, open this. You know what I'm saying? Like I was like, don't look at it, don't do nothing. But I was like, open this, if something happened to me. You know? So it was 2013. And the reason why I had wrote the letter was because I wasn't, let me say it right. I was, I wasn't contemplating suicide. I just didn't want to deal with the amount of hurt that I was going through. Literally, I didn't want to deal with it. And it had nothing to do with, you know, but it had nothing to do with personal life. It had everything to do with track and field. I'll sit here and tell y'all right here and right now. It was solely 100% track and field that pushed me to that point. Literally. Um, needless to say, y'all are watching me now, so of course it's, it, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't do it. Um, I found a reason, well actually, you know, I like to say God found a reason at that moment to stop me, all right? I won't get into all that, um, how it happened. But yeah, um, I did. And how I got to that point was, um, feeling like I was a, a failure again. Why was I feeling like I was a failure again? 2003, I was the, the top of the town in track and field. I knew who I was. Who I, here I am, this 23-year-old kid who's running, at that point in time, Tim Montgomery, to the line. Literally running him to the line. Um... I got my contract in 2003, you know, Nike gave me, what, they, they gave me like, um, what was it, $75,000 or whatever. And then, you know, to me as a kid, I, I, that was a lot of money, I was cool. Fast forward to 2005, it was my option year, they, they kept me for another option for another year, um, which was 2006 year. Um, 2007 year, they, they dropped me in 2007. Um, 2008, they dangled a contract in my face saying, if you do this, we'll give you this contract. If you go to USA's and finish here, we'll give you this. Now, keeping in mind, I don't have anything at this point in time. So I'm completely, completely broke. This is me coming off of getting, I had just got 30 indoor nationals, you know, running 6'5 or whatever. And they told me, it's like, well, if you do this, you do that, you do that, you do that. You know, you get this. Lo and behold, I didn't do it. I did not make the team in 2000, and I did not do anything at the trials in 2008 that they wanted me to do to make the money. So therefore, I was unemployed as a track runner. 2008 Olympic trials, I ran 10:06. Okay, I PR in the semis. It was the fastest time I'd ever ran. I PR. 
and I didn't make the finals, and I didn't get a contract, and I made zero money. So then I bust my tail 2008. 2009, I finally made the World Championship team. What a lot of people don't know is 2009, when I made that World Championship team, when people saw me jumping up and down, screaming, crying. I wasn't screaming and crying because I made a damn team. <laughs> Not even rem That was the last thing on my mind. I was screaming and crying because I knew I was off of my homeboy's couch. Okay? 2009, from during that whole pretty much track season, I was sleeping on my homeboy's couch. I was jumping a fence out of school to go to track practice. Now, now in, even in May, when I went to Brazil, I opened up in May with like 10.09. The second meet, I went 10.02, I went 20.17. This is in May, right? 2009. I don't went 20.17 and I'm Still broke. Yeah, even though I'm finna get the prize money from that from being in Brazil, but technically I'm still broke. Why? I don't have an apartment. All my stuff is in my car. I'm re I'm literally and really living out of my car, but I'm standing in my homeboy house on the couch. So I'm coming back from Brazil from racing still to nothing. So when I get to USA, my whole mind frame was I have to make a team because if I make this team, Nike's gonna give me a contract. And I made the team, and they gave me a contract. That's a problem in itself. Because the amount of pressure that was put on me by myself just to do that, let's say I did not perform, and it's another year where I just got now, I done did all this hard work, I done did all this running, and I'm going to go right back to my homeboy's couch. Okay? Fast forward to 2013. Here's what happened, all right? 2010, I had a stellar year. Go back and look at it. If you go back and look at it, I was number one in America all the way up until like freaking June. You know, like I was predicted to win USA's that year. Didn't. Don't worry about it. It's another story. That was all, I went 10 flat that year and everything. 2011 was an off year. I ran fast 2011. 2012, I ran fast again. 2012, though, this is my option year from my contract that I had just got with them, right? So since it's my option year, they have they have the option of keeping me or dropping me, make a long story short. So what ended up happening was, um, I was training, it was me, Wallace, Tyrone, Edgar, um, Doc, Jared Cunningham, all of us were training together. And the week before the 2012 Olympic trials for London, I was in, as we all said, I was in the best of my life. The Monday before, I popped my hamstring. These are true stories. It's, it's real. Popped my hamstring in Monday for trials. Out for the whole season, 2012. So guess what? Now, not only am I out for 2012, I can't go make no money for 2012 because I can't even run. So I don't make the team, nor can I run. And in the end of that, guess what Nike does? They cut me. Okay. So what happens now? All the money and everything I done bought from 2009 to 2012. I done bought two cars. Well, they ain't even paid for, of course. I got two cars. You know, I got two car notes. I, my condo is three-story condo. I had to walk into the front office and tell the lady in September, there's a good chance that I won't be able to finish out my lease. Why? I said because I'm pretty sure Nike's not going to resign me. Lo and behold, came January. Guess what happened? Nike didn't resign me. So I was evicted. I ended up having to go stay with um, my girlfriend at the time. It's 2013. So I'm training, trying to get back in it, trying to get back in it, get back in it. And then um, I break my jaw. I actually broke my jaw that year. And so when I came, when, my, when the wires came off my mouth, it was um, March. So I was able to go back to training. So I was able to run, I was able to race. Meanwhile, this whole time, you know, me and, me and my girlfriend, we having differences because I'm just not who I'm, who I feel like I'm nobody. Why do I feel like I'm nobody? I was just in a race with Usain Bolt, and now I'm scraping up chains to go to the store to get a soda, and I'm sleeping at my girlfriend's house. I feel like a nobody now. Mentally, I'm depressed as hell. So it don't work with me and her no more. So what ends up happening? Now I'm sleeping in a warehouse. Why am I sleeping in a warehouse? I'm sleeping in a warehouse because 
when I was making all this money, I I created my own music label and I built the music studio out of a warehouse. What ends up happening? I end up having to sleep in this music studio I created because I have no place else to go in Dallas. I have nowhere else to go. So I, I kept telling myself, I say, Ray, the only thing that's gonna get you back in the game is you got to get back to running. That's why a lot of folks didn't see me for so long. They didn't see me in, before I flipped with Nigeria because I was homeless. But anyway, I kept telling myself, like, bro, get back on the track. If you get back on track, it'll put you back on track. Okay? Here's how, I, here's why I did my, my suicide letter. I, I, I decided that. I got up, right? I was walking to the little store around the corner from every day. I was walking to the little store. And I would, I would buy a pint of beans for like a dollar and 15 cent. And I'd buy like a pint of rice for like a dollar and 15 cent. And I would get like a loaf of bread. That would be my food for like the next two days. You know, um, I, I would do stuff like I would ask, I would ask, my, ask a friend, ask my mom, like, hey, can I just borrow like $20? You know, because the way I looked at it, if I could borrow $20, I could stretch this $20 all the way out. Like, literally. <laughs> I was the king of stretching that 20, Jack. I'm talking about I would go load up on beans and rice. It got to the point to where the people that was at the Mexican store I was walking to, I think they knew that I was, I guess, quote unquote, struggling because I was coming getting rice and beans every day. So what they started doing was they started overloading my, 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 my bowls but not charging me for it. So I was like, cool. But anyway, so I'm going through all that. I'm eating beans and rice. I'm living out, out, out of the, I'm living out of the um, warehouse. But I'm still going to track practice. You feel me? I'm waking up every day. I'm going to the track. You know what I'm saying? I'm working out. And when I'm sitting in that warehouse going crazy, I would go outside at night and just run. You know, sometimes I would cry. Sometimes I would, I would just go run because I ain't having nothing to do. When the season started, I could not get a single track meet. And I don't work my ass off um, to be able to do this. I'm talking to my agent, like, John, I know, I, I, I've been hurt, yeah, yeah, but I got to get back. Can't get no lanes. Finally, he, he finally he tells me, Ray, somebody can give you a lane in, it was a meeting like freaking Poland somewhere, a little small meet. I finally feel like I got a chance to get back. Boom, I get back. I, I, I win the meet, but the earnings, the earnings wasn't a lot, and my travel costed more than my earnings. So to make a long story short, I had to literally steal from my agent because I was supposed to give my agent the travel money, right? I didn't give it to him because now I'm going back home, homeless and broke, okay? So I just had to owe you that, John. John, I just owe you this money. Don't worry about it because don't nobody know what I'm going through right now. So then I get back, still can't get no track meets, still can't get no track meets. I'm trying to run at USA's. I tell Duffy and them, hey, the fastest I've ran this year is 1034. Here's why. I broke my jaw. I know there's some type of some type of medical yada, yada, yada. You can do, do that. Make a long story short, they didn't let me in. All right? They didn't let me in. And at that point, I was like, it's over. It's literally over. I have nothing. Like, I've given it everything. I've tried. And I have nothing. I remember that day because I remember outside, I literally looked up and I, and I was just cursing at God. I literally was cursing at God like, how, why would you do this to me? Like, how and why? And then I remember saying, if, no, I said, I remember I looked up to the sky and I said, I'm not going to give, this is me talking to God. Okay, so of course, I've, we've said a lot of differences. I literally said, you gonna do it. I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna give you the benefit of me doing it. That's literally what I said. I was like, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna kill myself. You gonna do it. And I'm gonna stand right here until you do it. That's exactly what I did. I, I'm looking up to the sky and I was like, I don't wanna be here anymore. Lo and behold, I get a phone call. <laughs> I love that phone. But anyway, the phone call I got, it, it, it reminded me of why I needed to be here. And that me being here was so bigger than track and field. I, and th at that moment, I snapped out of it like, bro, what the is you doing? You got a, you got all this, you got a whole, what are you doing? Like, you're allowing this selfish, you're being that selfish to where you're allowing this sport 
to consume you so much that you are ready to die? And there's people over here that actually need you. That was what woke me up. That snapped me out of it quick. And at that moment, I was like, no, nah, this ain't it. I got to figure some shit out. So after that, I was staying with one of my homeboys. And then another homeboy called me. He was like, um, this is when I was at the warehouse. He called me. He was like, hey, I just got a house. You want to rent out the other room? I said, man, I can't pay you nothing for the other room, man. I ain't making no money trying for none of that. And then he was like, well, just come on anyway. I said, but hey, bro, I said, I got a plan, though. <laughs> I told him, I said, I got a plan, though. I said, man, I'm going to be a personal trainer. I said, I got to do something to make some income. I can't keep doing this. You know what I'm saying? I said, man, the one thing I do know how to do is run fast. And I know that if I just give somebody my basic warm up, that's a workout. So when he, when, when he let me stay with him, I got my, this is 2013, yeah, 13, I got my first two clients, right? So I'm making, I'm charging my clients $55. I'm making $110, right? I'm making $110 a week. I had one of my homeboys um, paying my, my, I had a Metro PCS phone. I had one of my homeboys paying my Metro PCS phone bill for me. So I could have a phone. I'm not telling him, bro, I don't, I, my phone bill at that time was like 40 bucks. Like, do you mind, you know what I'm saying? So I can keep my phone on. I'm trying to build up and get some clients. So I had somebody pay. And this is 2013, y'all. This is after I don't ran 10 on 2. This is after I've been ranked number 10 in the world. It's after that. So anyway, get my first two clients. So I'm catching, I'm, I'm going to tell y'all the truth. I was walking a mile and a half from my homeboy's house who let me borrow the room to the bus station. And then I was riding the bus for a whole nother hour to get to SMU. My commute, I would leave the house at 11 o'clock in the morning just to make it to practice at 2 o'clock. That was my commute. And I would work out at SMU, and then I would catch another train to an apartment complex that I knew had the, um, they never locked their weight room. So I would do my weights in there. Make a long story short, a lot of people start seeing because I was being more vocal about it, like, man, I'm broke. I ain't got nothing. Folks is like, man, how the hell with Ray? Come over here. You know, I'm going to help you out. I mean, that's like people start letting me come to gyms and stuff like that, the train, yada, yada, yada. And then I got the, I was at practice one day and then, you know, Coach Bean was like, hey, man, Nigeria is looking for athletes. If you got any type of, I said, Coach Bean, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm gonna tell y'all honest to God truth. This was gonna be this is this was gonna be crazy about it. Why I'm back with Team USA trying to help them. On everything I love, I literally told Coach Bean, I said, Coach Bean, tell Nigeria I don't give a damn. I will run for them. Whatever I gotta do to get back in the sport and no longer put on a USA uniform, I am all for it. Why? Because that is why I am homeless. Because of that team, because of those politics, because of how these shoe companies work, because of how they do us, that is why I am homeless. And they're not letting me back in. Why they're not letting me back in? Because of them, I'm washed up. Why am I washed up? Well, you ain't been to USA in two years, you ain't ran fast, so I, they not even trying to let me back in. So Nigeria actually saved me. The reason why I'm here now is because of Team Nigeria. That's why I will, I mean, even what they did to me in Rio, and I get to that, I can't really be mad at them because if it wasn't for Nigeria, I wouldn't even be here now. Why? Because they gave me a shot. They said, okay, Ray, come to our trials, come here and run. So here I am again, back in that same boat I was in in 2009, running to get off of a couch. But then it was different because I didn't feel the pressure before. Because I had already started to build my business. By the time I went that summer around with Nigeria, I had picked up like four people. So I was already starting to make a little bit of money, you know, in personal training. Fast forward all the way up to now. All right, we're just gonna jump to now. Right now, outside, 
I got a hundred thousand dollar Mercedes MSRP. Some of y'all have seen it. If you follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and stuff, you've seen it. I got a Mustang sitting outside. That's my toy now. It's outside. My my rent alone is over two thousand dollars for everywhere I've stayed at and since for the past four and a half five years. Olympic Fit, I'm co-owner of that. I'm co-owner because I created it and decided to get somebody that was smarter than me to be my business partner to help me run it. I own that. If you go to your app store right now, and I'll show you. If you go to your app store, and if you type in G-O-C-H-Y-R-O, -O, it says Go Cairo. An app's going to pull up, okay? The app that's going to pull up is going to look like this, all right? That's my app. I own that. I, I created that. I had the idea. I had the vision. I wrote it out. I hired developers. I hired a team. When I launched my app, I had over 161 chiropractors nationwide underneath my umbrella that I created. Why am I telling y'all that backdrop story? I'm telling y'all that backdrop story for y'all to understand that track and field will put more mental pressure on you to where the, act, the average world don't know what we go through. They see us on TV and because we're on TV, they automatically think we're making money. They see us at Olympic Games, they automatically think, oh, you got to be making millions. No, not at all. They don't understand. Okay? Everything I have now, I created from that seed of when I was about to kill myself. Why well, was I about to kill myself? Because of the stress and the damn pressure from track and field. The stress and the pressure don't come from racing. The stress and the pressure comes from, can I fucking eat? <laughs> like, that's where the stress and the pressure come from. The stress and the pressure don't come from, can I beat somebody on Saturday? No, can I win so that I can get off the damn floor? That's the pressure. Because what happens when you put all of that effort into it and you don't make it? Now you got to, you know, without a shadow of a doubt, when you leave that track, say it's at USA's, you know without a shadow of a doubt, when you leave that track, you either going to be broke for an entire year, literally, if you ain't got no regular job, you either going to be broke for an entire year, or you're going to be taken care of for an entire year. That's it. And then people be like, okay, well, why you won't get a job then? Jack, how am I going to work a damn job when my body is what's going to determine my own worth. So if I'm working a job and this job is tearing my body apart, I hate to be here, I'm behind the desk, whatever it is, how in the hell am I going to have the body or the energy to even work out? How am I going to get the best out of me to be an Olympic athlete, to be a professional track and field athlete, if I got to go to a fucking job? I can't be the best I can be. Okay? So, with all that being said, I came up with a plan, y'all, because that's what I do. <laughs> that's what I do. I'm a numbers person. That's what I do now. I'm a numbers person. I'll, I'll, everything that I have that you see is because I created it, literally. You know, I'm not trying to toot my own horn or no shit like that, but I'm just being honest. I didn't let track and field consume me. It did, but then I fought back. So now, because I went through all that and I understand it, that is why I started Raise Tape. That is why I started bringing athletes home. That is why I speak so much now and I speak so vocal because like, no, I've been there before. I've been there. I know what they're going through. I know what all of them are going through from the top to the bottom. Not just because I talk to them, but because I've been through it. I know what it feels like. I know the hurt that these athletes are going through just from being at the games and people talking about how they ran bad, not understanding how the sport works. 
That's why I created the show. So people would get it. Like, no, it's more than what you're seeing on TV. Here is what you're not seeing. Here's what you're not understanding. You're not understanding that it takes the human body 10 days to get acclimated. That's why they look bad in Tokyo. I'm coming to explain that to y'all for the aid of the athlete because I know what that hurt feels like. That's why I don't sat here with me. When I was blocked on YouTube and I kept telling y'all, I'm coming back. Don't worry about it. That's because I have what a lot of track and field athletes have not done. I created a brand that is Monzavia Selwoods, okay? I have attorneys that will protect this brand, okay? I have business people that will protect this brand. I have investors that will protect this brand. So the minute YouTube and Flowtrack put them claims on me, oh, y'all don't really know. I'm not that athlete that y'all think I am. I'm not that track athlete that y'all used to know running. I'm not none of these, and no disrespect to any track athlete, I'm not saying that, but I'm not none of these athletes out here. You want to go to court? Let's go. It won't make it, but we can try. Why? Because I have learned you have to have certain people. You have to have a certain team. So that's why I'm going to get back on YouTube. Now, the reason why I'm saying that stuff is because I've learned a lot off the track about business. So that's why I've been so vocal and I've been listening. I've been listening to the athletes. I've been listening to the coaches. I've been listening to the chairmen. I've been listening to the people on the top top. <laughs> I've been on these phones. I've been listening. Why? Because I love America. I love the sport. I love all of it that much to where I want to see change for the athletes. I don't want us to continue to go through what we've been going through. I don't want athletes, com I don't want athletes committing suicide. I don't want athletes contemplating it. I don't want athletes going through depression. I don't want athletes getting, getting pointed at and fingers picked at them because they said they was going through something and they went and got high. I don't want that no more. Okay? How do we fix that? I'm glad you asked. So what I did was I got together with my people. I sat down. I said, look here, team. I know y'all all about Ray. Okay? But what Ray need is, Ray needs y'all advice and Ray needs y'all input. Ray need all y'all smart people to help me with something different that I'm, I'm not even get paid for. <laughs> and they look at me like, huh? that's not, that ain't you, Ray. You mean you're going to do something and you're not, you ain't got a cut of it? No. Because that's me, I'm a businessman. If I'm not getting a cut of it, it's very rare I'm going to move. I'm a businessman. I'm just being honest with y'all right now. This is, this is an open, honest race tape. So I told him, I was like, nah, listen, here's the problem with track and field, and I want to fix it. Help me come up with a solution. So I explained it to him. And then I got on the phone with some people at USA Track and Field. I asked some questions. They gave me some answers. A lot of stuff I didn't know. I said, okay, Jack, I can take it from here. First and foremost, let's get, let's get into that part. I tweeted last night that the bonuses go to the U.S. Olympic Committee. That is correct, okay? For all of those medals that you saw Team USA go get, you know who got those bonuses? USOPC people. They got those bonuses. For all those medals, they got them. And then people are tweeting about the little thing that they have for track and field athletes. Well, it says here the athlete. Don't worry about what they say. Well, right here in these tiers, don't worry about those tiers. You think a $10,000 tier is going to be enough to feed somebody for a whole damn year? It's not. It's not at all. So I'm talking to the track and field um, people, and, and they're, they're giving me a lot of insight. Let's, I'm going to go ahead and clear this part up right now. Since we, we, we started, we're going to go there. That relay was not the athlete's fault. That relay went the head coach's fault. Here's what went down with that relay, okay? The reason why... I'm going to go and put it out there. The reason why Team USA did not have any relay practices nor any relay camps because the coach that was in charge of the relays did not give any information for them to have any camps. And that is the truth. That came directly from USATL. They said, listen here. Here's what happened, Okay. He wanted a budget like the old days. 
He wanted a budget that he could use for relay camps. They said, we can't give you a budget, but what we can do is we can pay for it. Let me make that make sense to y'all, which is, which is regular business. That's why I'm sitting here like, that makes perfect sense. I get it. They wanted a budget that they could control and say, give us X amount of dollars and we'll spend it on the relay camps, yada, yada, yada. USATF said, no, we're not doing that. I get it. Why do I get it? I'm not going to just give you a water cash anymore for you to go do whatever with it. Why? I'll tell you why. When we gave y'all that money, you had these camps and you still dropped the stick. That's why you don't get the lump sums anymore because it didn't work. That's business. We gave you X amount of dollars to complete a project. That project wasn't completed. You think we're going to keep funding it? No, we're not going to keep funding it. It's done. Okay? Now, here's what they said, though. Instead of you giving, instead of us giving you this lump sum, just tell us. Just say, hey, we want to go to this place. We want to go to that place. We want to take this amount of athletes. Here's the list. Turn that in. Okay, what happens now? USATF will pay for it. That was the, that was the, the that's what a lot of people don't understand. This is from the conversation I had last night. That is what the whole confusion was with these relay camps. The head relay coach wanted the lump sum of money to pretty much divvy it up, do whatever, however. USATF said, we're no longer doing that. We, no, those days are over with. But what you can do is, you can tell us where you want to go and we'll book the tickets. You can tell us where you want this camp at and we'll book the hotels, but we're not giving you the money for it. That makes sense to me. So the person to blame, the child can blame, stop, don't blame them athletes, don't blame them coaches, don't blame none of the, blame the one person who's in charge of that. Because that one person had the power to say, okay. And that one person did not say, okay. That one person screwed up the relay and screwed up the athletes and screwed up that mother. I'm sorry, you know, if you see the video, I still love you, but I got to tell the truth. I still love you to death, but I got to tell the truth. And I'm telling you the same thing. You should have went with the way they were trying to do it. Not your old way. That is what screwed everything up. And now we can see that, okay? The other thing we talked about, I'm getting to the main thing, which is, which is, the, which is the pay, but I had to get it out of there. So the other question I had, I literally said, okay, so they telling me, this is what I keep hearing. I said, I keep hearing that y'all got the money. Y'all just don't want to give it up. Don't, I, I keep asking everybody. I was like, man, so you're trying to get me broke. And everybody's like, man, they ain't broke at all. And so they ain't know they told me. They said, right, that's 100% correct. We are not broke. <laughs> that was not the answer I was expecting. I was expecting them to say, yeah, you know, money's tight. It's been tight since, you know. No, that's not what they said at all. When I asked that question, they said, yeah, we do have the money. So then I had to ask another question. I say, okay, well, if you got the money, why, why ain't y'all giving it to the athletes? And you said, great. What athletes? The pro athletes. Who's a pro athlete? What you mean? Who's a oh, so this is how he broke it down to me. He broke it down to me. He said, Ray, there was X amount of dollars set aside, literally, there was X amount of dollars set aside for that reason. For y'all to get paid. For professional track athletes to get a stipend and have a salary. And I said, okay, well, what happened? He said two things, right? One, nobody could define what a professional track athlete was. I said, wait a minute, what? Huh? Say, uh, what? Say it again. Nobody could define to me, um, Max, Max, the head honcho. Nobody could define what a professional track athlete was. So how can we give anybody the money if we can't decide? And then they went and told me, and it was an athlete, actually a couple of athletes, who we said, okay, we're cool with that. Tell us. Who's a pro? 
And so they sent the athletes out to figure it out. How do you determine who's a professional athlete? They couldn't figure it out. I can tell you why you couldn't figure it out. And this is no disrespect. Y'all know I love all y'all. It's no disrespect to anybody. But you can't figure it out because you had non-business people trying to make a business transaction. That ain't going to never work. You had non-business people. And again, it's not being disrespectful toward the athletes. And even if y'all watch, I'm not being disrespectful towards you. I tell you to your face. I tell you the same thing. This ain't your, this ain't your field of play. It's not your field of play. Your field of play was what you was doing on the track. Your field of play was what you were doing in, 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 in the field events. This ain't your field of play. You need to allow people, hell, I'm even saying me and my team and other athletes, you need to allow people into this field of play, okay, that can make these type of decisions and determine what is a professional athlete. And then they went and said, okay, Ray, well, and the second problem is, you know that annual meeting? And I was like, man, I ain't never go to that shit, man. I ain't, I ain't been to a single one. And he said, Ray, that's the problem. All of y'all who was at the top and still at the top, y'all blow off the meeting. Why is this meeting so important, Ray? Because this is where we get to listen to you. He said, Ray, at these meetings, you know who typically shows up? Mm -mm, who? One or two coaches and the athletes that show up are going to be your, your road, your road walkers, your, you know, your bottom level athletes. These are the athletes that are showing up to speak for y'all. So when we're asking athletes, what do you need? What's going on? Y'all ain't here to tell us. We hear you complaining out there, but you're not here to tell us or tell us how to fix it. And every time we tell you, okay, we're listening, come back and give us an idea or a plan, you don't bring one back. So now I'm sitting here like, you know, again, from my business mind, I'm like, Jack, that makes perfect sense. Like, that makes perfect sense. And he's like, yeah, right. They're not showing up at the meetings. So when we make these decisions, we get information from these five K B walkers and stuff. Okay. And then he was like, you've been on the circuit, right? You know what it's like. You know what it's like living without the money? Ain't nobody here to, to, to speak up and talk about it. I said, damn, Jack, you, you, hitting some, you hitting some shit right now. He said, you need all of your top dogs at this meeting. This is literally telling me. You need all of the top dogs at the meeting. You don't need the bottom puppies at the meeting. They can come, but just know that these are the ones that's making decisions for y'all. Why? Because y'all won't show up. Damn. Okay. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. So all this time when y'all been telling us every year, come to the meeting, come to the meeting, we don't. We should have been there. Yeah, stupid. Mm -hmm. All right. I got to be a stupid now because I never went to a meeting. So then he went and said, you know what, Ray? I'm personally inviting you. No, no, I want you to come. I want you to come to the meeting. I'm personally inviting you because I want you to see it. I want you to see what goes on. You've never been there. I want you to see it. I want you to be there. I said, you know what, Jack? I got one better. Not only am I going to be there, I appreciate the invite. I'm coming with friends, Talk on it. I'm going to get me a... I'm, not only am I coming with friends, can I get at least two more invites? Like one for, you know, my CFO and my, my whole branding thing and like my branding team. If not, that's cool. You just want me to come. That's cool. I just come with myself. I can my whole team, though. I take my whole team. But anyway, I say, man, listen. I say, respectfully... What's the budget? I asked what the budget was. And they told me X amount of dollars. I was like, okay, damn. I said, okay, well, let me ask you this. If, if I was to be able to come up with a plan, which I'll hear it out. And if I come up with a plan with that same proposal, whatever y'all had two, three years ago when y'all was like, well, what defines a professional athlete? If I come up with a plan for that, would you hear me out? At least hear me out. Right, that's what the meetings are for. Okay, well, check this out, Jack. Can I have 24 hours to come up with some ideas and shoot them to you? Yeah. All right. What ideas was those? I'm glad you asked. I'm about to read them to you. Okay. This is going to have to be a two-part um, raise take. I'll probably come on tomorrow or sometime later on and stay on this topic, but it's going to be a two-part. So here's what I wrote up, all right? And y'all can tell me 
When y'all watching these videos, if you like this idea, go in the comments and tell, tell us, yes, that's a great idea. If you don't like this idea I'm about to put out there, go in the comments and tell me, no, it's not a good idea. If it's something in here you about to hear me say that you think is, is, can be, you know, done better or done differently, do not hesitate to comment down here, okay? This is our, when I say our, me and my team, this is our rough draft on how we can create track and field, a track and field pro system, okay? Here it is. Okay, stay with me. In the track and field pro system, you would have 42, of, I'm gonna say it right. There's 42 events for men and women, okay? That's 42, that includes everything. There's, in this track and field pro system, there will be only 16 pros per event, okay? Let me say it again. There's only 16 professional athletes per event, why? I don't know how many damn quarterbacks is there. But anyway, I, we'll get to that later. 16 pros per event. That means there's only 672 professional track and field athletes, which is actually a lot. 672 professional track and field athletes. Here's how I have it broke down for pay. Base for non-premier events is $25,000, okay? The salary cap for non-premier events is 50000 what does that mean? That means no matter what, you're going to make $25,000 flat for the next three years. Don't matter. You're going to make that. Or you're going to make $50,000 for the next three years. What are your, your non-premier events? Sprints and hurdles are premier events. Now, let's not sit here and, and pretend like they're not. And the reason why I say that is because this right here. The quarterback is gonna get a larger salary than the kicker. Okay, I'm not. I'm not trying to discredit anything that anybody do. I'm literally turning this thing. I'm basing it off of a business. It's not a premier event, but you will get paid. Okay. Now, with that alone, the budget for one team for one team is 1.2 million dollars. So 1.2 million dollars can cover. The base salary or the salary, that's the median, of one team out of the nine teams that I have on here, okay? So that's 1.2 million that will cover a whole team's base salary for non-premier events. For premier events, the base, the least you can make for a premier event it's $50,000. That's the least, $50,000 a year. The salary cap for that is $100,000, okay? That means the most you can pay a sprinter on your team, the most a sprinter can get paid is $100,000, all right? These contracts are three-year contracts. Why did I say three years? Because that's about fair, all right? Three-year deal, three-year deals, okay? Now, the budget for that is $3.6 million. So it'll take you $3.6 million to run um, your team to pay them for the premier events, all right? Hold on. The contracts are determined by the coaches, the organizations that the coach belongs to. That's who determines if you finna get picked up. There's no more shoe company, no more my college coach. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. There's only nine teams. And out of these nine teams, if you become pro, it's because the front office at that team, that coach and the rest of the coaches said, we'll take that athlete. Outside of that, you're not pro. There's no more of this, well, my coach gonna sign up in high school. Well, guess what? You ain't pro then. If you're not a part of these nine teams, you're not a professional track and field athlete. Sorry. All right, now let's move right along. Coaches are allowed up to four male and four female athletes for the sprints. Two male and two female athletes for distance, mid-distance, and, and for field events. If an athlete doubles, that counts as two athletes. What does that mean? That means if you want to do the 100 and the 200, 
Guess what? You can do that. But your team loses a person now. That counts as two. You don't get that no more. All right? If you got somebody that want to do the one, the two, and the four, that's fine too, Jack. That's fine too. But you're still only getting that base salary of whatever that is, $100,000, and you can't get another person for those events. Simple. All right? Paid coaches. Here's the part that flips, okay? Coaches, you're the team, okay? The team gets one head coach, one field event coach, one sprint coach, one hurdle coach to where y'all got to actually work together. You got to go hire them. You got to go find them, okay? The budget that is allowed to pay coaches, $300,000. you are not making more than the athletes. You're not. $300,000 finna have to cover all of your coaches. So if you finna go hire one big, great coach, <laughs> you ain't got $300,000, all right? But anyway, moving right along. All right, sorry about that. I had to do some deletion. Get it back. All right, so what was it? Okay, we just paid the coaches. Okay, now, your team size cap, that's 48 sprinters and hurdlers combined, 32 field events. That's 80 athletes per team, okay? 80 athletes per team. Now you have nine total teams, okay? Nine teams, 80 athletes. It sounds like a lot, don't it? It's really not. When my whole thing is broken down, you're going to see how mm -mm, it's actually very doable. It's not hard at all. Why is it not hard? Because you're getting paid for it like a professional sport now. But anyway, um, now with that being said, here's what, the, what a team cost would be. For you to run an entire team and pay an entire team for an entire year, it would cost $5.1 million, Okay. $5.1 million covers one whole team. And that's everything I just know, everything I just lined out, everybody gets paid. Everybody gets paid, okay? You asked, okay, well, what's the main budget? All right, I'm glad you asked that. To run all nine teams, it would take $46 million a year, okay? $46 million a year. So with $46 million a year, you can make sure every Professional track and field athlete, because we just defined what makes you a pro, is paid every year. And those contracts, good for three years. All right? Now, where can the money come from? I'm glad y'all asked that. So this is what I found out last night when I was on the phone. They sent me some information. I didn't even know this. Team USA has 30 different, 30 different sponsors worldwide. 30. Oh, good information for me to use. Watch this. Team USA has option one. Here's the question. Where can you get the money from? Option one. Team USA has 30 different sponsors worldwide. Each sponsor should be paying at least $1 million toward the professional athlete budget. Okay. That will cover $30 million of the budget, leaving USATF only to have to cover $16 million out of their budget. All right? That's option one. Option two. Team USA can ask the sponsors for $1.5 million, which totals $45 million, and would only have to come out of pocket $1 million. Option three. Allow in bigger sponsors than the 30 you have, if they can't cover it, allow in bigger sponsors with bigger marketing budgets to spend. For example, Uber spends $1 billion a year on just marketing. A lot of people probably know that. Yeah, on just their marketing alone, on their commercials, on their, bro they spend over a billion dollars. Hmm, do you think a track athlete could market Uber? You think a track team could possibly market Uber? So Uber is giving up $1 billion for marketing? Oh, yeah, and, and you know when y'all go to these little places and these little restaurants, whatever, and they're asking you to take a survey, and they're always like, you always skip the surveys, but everybody asking for surveys or customer surveys. Most companies spend at least a quarter of their income on those surveys. So you take somebody like a Chili's. Chili's is dishing out easily. I think it was like... 
um, 10 million a quarter when me and my team looked up, like 10 million a quarter on just surveys. Just getting people to say if they like the food or not, they dishing out 10 million. Anyway, um, <laughs> teams can also, here's the big one, teams can also go out and seek their own sponsorships as well along with athletes. All right? Here's another one. Athletes, these are my, my notes I'm giving y'all now. Athletes are also able to be sponsored by any outside company. Don't matter. Don't matter. You can go get your money from anybody. All right? Outside companies are able to pay to have their commercials featuring their track athletes during the time of a competition. For example, paid advertisement is king during the Super Bowl. What I'm saying is, okay, well, if Trayvon Bromel just got a deal with Uber and Uber is saying, we're going to sponsor Trayvon, or Uber says, you know what, we're going to sponsor this coach's whole team, i.e. like, you know, I don't know, like when Nick and Sam sponsors damn Dallas Cowboys. Anyway, I don't know why this seems so hard to do. But anyway, so now once you do that, you allow these companies to pay for their advertisement with their athlete. So when you're watching Prefontaine and an Uber commercial pops up, it should be an Uber commercial with an athlete who's running. That's what they pay for. That's what companies pay for. I know this because I have one. <laughs> no, I know these budgets. I'm sitting here telling y'all. This ain't no mythical shit I'm making up. It ain't like, no, this, this is how it works, Jack. Telling you. But anyway, all right. So now, my other little ashes. This is my notes, like I told you, my little notes. My other little ashes note is my last one, this right here, okay? Drug testing will continue to be random, but athletes can only be tested three times in a whole season. I'll say it again. Drug testing will continue to be random, but athletes can only be tested three times in a whole season. Or I should say three times in a whole off season. I'll say it right. You can only test an athlete three times in the off season, period. Flat. No three times a day. No three times a week. No three times a month. No worry about filings. Three times. Okay? Why? Oh, I'm glad you asked. This will fix missed tests due to whereabouts, i.e., why the hell is Christian Coleman not running? Because he missed some tests? That's stupid. It's not how you run a professional freaking sport. This will fix missed tests due to whereabouts. If an athlete fails a test, they will be fined up. If you fail a test, you fail one of them three tests, you're getting a fine. Why? Because you've been getting paid. So you could pay this fine. You're going to get fined. We ain't going to kick you out, but you're going to lose some money. Okay? If they receive multiple failures, guess what? Now you're gone. Why? That's what every professional sport does. If we want to be a professional sport, we just got to operate like one. That's what I've been sitting here battling for like the past two days. Like, how is this shit not possible? Like, it's simple. It's, it's not hard to determine how to be a professional sport. How is it not hard? I don't know. You got freaking 10 other ones that gave me, they giving you the blueprint. <laughs> like, what do you mean you don't know how to turn into a professional sport? It's 15 other professional sports you can go look at. That's your blueprint. Literally, that's your blueprint. That's all I think I did. All I did was merge what I know from business and from sports, put it the damn together. That's it. 56. Let me find the number again. I know y'all have a lot of questions. That's why we, I'm gonna have to do. I'm gonna do a whole nother. Don't worry about it. Let me find my number again, my magic number, because I, I got it in here. It was fifty something. Oh no, I'm sorry, not fifty six. Forty six million dollars a year. I'm gonna put it into perspective for y'all. Um, to run, to do what I'm saying to do, can be done with forty six million dollars. The average basketball player's contract is over that. <laughs> Superstar athlete is making well up in the 200, 300 millions. 
LeBron James himself could fund the entire track and field professional organization for an entire year and use it as a tax write-off. Because it's only 46 million. My plan only has 46 million dollars in it. I go back to my favorite company, Uber. The reason why I love Uber is because when I created my app, Go Cairo, it, I literally took Uber's blueprint. So I learned everything they did. <laughs> but anyway, Uber. Do you know what Uber would do it if they were presented with marketing and people was asking for $46 million? I'm going to make it make sense to y'all. When I was building my app, I was doing a lot of doing a lot of research on apps and stuff like that. And this is the kicker that's going this the kicker that's gonna make y'all have to see what I'm saying is very doable. There's an app. It's a dog walking app. A lady created it, right? Before this lady even had, you know, no, I'm saying it right. She was she was eight months in. She got for her seed money. A lot of y'all know what seed money is. If you don't seed money, pretty much what you need to get your startup going. She got $55 million seed money. She got $55 million to create her company. She got $55 million to build her app. You mean to tell me we can't get $46 million to turn this shit into a professional sport? That is impossible. $55 million seed money for an app that walks dogs.